Hello everybody and welcome to Law and Court Cases, and in today's video we'll be covering the woman who claimed her innocence in court, but was found guilty of a heinous murder. I'm talking about the case of Jodie Arias and the murder of Travis Alexander. This case was fueled by lies and craziness, so without further ado, let's just get into the video. Travis Alexander was born on July 28, 1977, in Riverside, California, to Gary David Alexander and Pamela Elizabeth Morgan Alexander. He did not have an easy early life as his parents were addicted to drugs and he and his siblings were physically abused by their mother. At the age of eight, Travis moved in with his paternal grandparents after his father's death in July 1997. His seven siblings were also taken in by their paternal grandmother. Their grandmother was a devout Mormon and introduced Travis to her faith, and he took to it. From this point on, his faith became very important to him. He performed stand-up comedy and was a salesman and motivational speaker for prepaid legal services called Legal Shield. He was very successful, owned his own home, and had a great career, as well as writing a book called Raising Me. Jody Arias was born on July 9th, 1980, in Salinas, California, to parents William and Sandra Arias. She attended school until 11th grade, at which point she dropped out. She was an aspiring photographer and worked odd jobs to keep herself afloat. She had moved to California with a boyfriend at the time. Jody had gotten a sales position for prepaid legal services, the same company that Travis worked for. This is how they would meet. Arias and Alexander met in September of 2006 at a work conference in Las Vegas, Nevada. They were at a team dinner when Travis approached Jody, introducing himself to her and the rest of the table. Friends said there was an instant connection and they hit it off very quickly. Reportedly, they stayed up till 4am just talking. After the events of this, Travis would go on to gush to friends that he had found his wife and this is the woman he was going to marry. Once the conference was over, both parties went their separate ways, returning to their homes in Arizona and California. Once Jodie returned to her home, she ended her relationship with her boyfriend on the grounds of wanting different things. Travis was conflicted. He knew he had fallen head over heels for Jodie, but at the same time, he knew he couldn't marry her because she wasn't Mormon, something he intended to try and change. Travis would begin sending representatives of his church to her door as a means to further convince Jodie to convert. When they spoke, he would find a way to include Bible verses and send her gifts such as paintings of Jesus. Arias had already previously considered becoming Mormon, so it did not take her much convincing. Alexander's efforts proved successful because Arias converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and was baptised by him on November 26, 2006, in a ceremony in Southern California. Travis and Jody then decided to make things official and they began dating in February of 2007. Despite dating long distance, the relationship seemed strong. The duo would take frequent trips together and take many photos of their lavish holidays all over the world. Despite his dedication to his faith, Alexander and Jody were having premarital sex, which the Mormon church forbids. Travis was racked with guilt over this and frequently called Jody a slut in texts and emails, but he also felt like she was his kryptonite and he couldn't stay away. Many of Travis's friends also brought up their concerns regarding Jodie and Travis's relationship. They felt she was overly attached and even possessive of Travis. They would find her eavesdropping on their conversations and she would also look through his emails and social media. Despite what he liked about Jodie, Travis did go on to end the relationship, feeling too guilty about having sex outside of marriage and also due to the concerns raised by his friends. Despite this decision, Travis still swore that she was a good person. The relationship didn't truly end though as the pair continued to see one another. This caused Jodie's obsession to become even more out of control. Travis went on to see other women and Jodie responded viciously. She slashed his tires and hacked his Facebook account to talk to and intercept messages sent to Travis from other women. Perhaps even more terrifying than this, Jodie would also frequently break into his house using the lock codes and also on another occasion use his dog's doggy door to get into the property. Jodie, no longer able to afford her home in California, decided to make the move to Mesa, Arizona, where Travis lived. She claimed Travis begged her to move there, but in reality, she moved to his city and bought a home not too far away from him without Travis having any knowledge of this fact. This led to yet another encounter of Jodie's stalker behaviour. She arrived at Travis's home with the alleged plan to surprise Travis with her news. Once she arrived at the property, she proceeded to look through the windows and spotted Travis on a date with another woman. On another occasion, when Travis was on a date in his home, he was watching a movie with this girl and his dog started barking. Upon inspection, Travis finds Jodie outside of his home. Her excuse was that she was there to watch them sleep. Travis then tells her to leave and she does. Travis had a conversation with Jodie and encouraged her to move back to California to move in with her grandparents. He wanted her to figure things out and hoped that down the line they could be friends. Jodie jumped at the opportunity to remain part of Travis's life and moved back to California. During her time in California, Jodie would work as a waitress and continue to pursue her passion for photography. During this time, she also began talking to another member of the prepaid legal services called Ryan Burns. He was also Mormon and lived in Utah. 
The two communicated for a while and agreed they would meet up soon. In February 2008, Travis would go on to meet a woman called Mimi at a singles night that was held by his church, and once again, he was enamoured by her and wanted to impress her. Initially, Mimi was not impressed and thought of herself and Travis as no more than being friends. Alexander decided to play the long game. However, it was also during this time that Jodie would once again begin to reach out to Travis. They would have sexually explicit phone calls, calls that Jodie would be recording without Travis's knowledge, and she would also constantly be sending emails and leaving voicemails for Travis. A heated email chain was exchanged between the two in which Travis called Jodie a liar and told her he never wanted to speak to her again. It was unclear what caused the argument to stir, but it was evident that there was a passionate hatred from Travis towards Jodie at this point in time. On May 28, 2008, an alleged burglary took place at Jodie's grandparents' home, with minimal items stolen, one being her grandfather's handgun. On June 2nd, Jodie made plans to drive to Utah to meet up with Ryan Burns, her new love interest. Jodie booked a budget to rent a car for this trip, and it was situated more than an hour away from her home. The initial car that was bought out was red, to which Jodie quickly declined and asked for a different one on the grounds of it attracting attention. Instead, she hired a white Ford Focus. During her trip, Jodie's phone was turned off for a period of time. Arias claimed it died, but it was turned back on a few hours later. Jodie was supposed to arrive in Utah on June 4th, but did not arrive until the next day. Ryan said that when Jodie had arrived, her normally blonde hair was dyed brown and she had cuts on her hands. Multiple calls, texts and emails were placed by Jodie to Travis during her trip. She even left a voicemail where she told him about her trip to Utah and about how she had driven 100 miles in the wrong direction. This voicemail was placed on the night that Travis Alexander was murdered. When the rental car was returned, the floor mats were missing and there were red spots in the car, which Jodie claimed were Kool-Aid stains. Unfortunately, the car was cleaned before police could investigate this. During this time, Travis was gearing up for yet another work trip, but this time to Cancun, Mexico. He was getting into shape and had plans to take his new friend Mimi along with him. His aim was to invite her as a friend in hopes that he could charm her whilst on this trip to see him into a different light. On the evening of June 4th, Travis missed an important work conference call, something he never did and this raised alarm bells for some of his friends. By June 9th, nobody had heard from Travis, so a small group of friends went to his home to go and check in on him along with Mimi. They got no response after knocking on the door. Fortunately, one of the friends knew the pin code to open the garage door, so they entered through there and then into the home. Once inside, Travis's roommate leaves his room and asks the small group what they were doing. Due to playing loud music, he did not hear them knocking. They asked his roommate about Travis's whereabouts. The roommate thought he had already left for his trip to Cancun, but was informed that they were not due to leave for said trip until June 10th, the following day. The group approaches Travis's door, which is locked. Using the spare key, the roommate opened the door. They said that as soon as they opened the door, a putrid smell came through, and upon inspection of the room, they saw blood spots all over the carpet. The roommate investigates further, only to now find a deceased Travis naked and in the fetal position in his shower of his ensuite bathroom. Mimi then stepped outside to call the police to the scene. Upon seeing what she saw from the doorway of the room, she did not want to go any further, and I don't blame her. What the police found was a brutal scene, with blood everywhere. Investigators asked the roommate and the friends in attendance who could have had the motive to do such a thing, to which the group collectively replied with the only person they thought could be responsible for this, and that was Jodie Arias. Detectives knew from the scene in front of them that this attack was indeed personal. It was clear to them that Travis had fought back against his attacker, but unfortunately he lost his life. Travis Alexander was stabbed 27 times, his throat had been cut and he had also been shot in the head. They determined that Travis was in fact murdered on June 4th, 2008, the day he had missed the conference call. A funeral was planned for Travis by all of his friends and family, but also in attendance at this funeral was Jodie. She managed to somehow get the information about the whereabouts and the time of the funeral. This ballsy display did not go unnoticed by Travis's friends and family. Police were still actively investigating the murder and trying to find additional evidence. It was during this time that Jodie started calling the police and talking to the detectives working on the case. She told them she no longer lived in Mesa but wanted to be of any assistance. A point that stuck out to the detectives was Jodie's insistence that she couldn't overpower Travis as he had been working out and getting into shape and she theorised that it instead had to be two people who killed Travis. Whilst investigating the scene of the crime, they came across a bloody handprint on the wall and also a spot of blood on the washing machine. The blood was taken for testing and they opened the washing machine to see what was inside. Inside the drum, they found bed sheets and a camera. The camera had gone through the wash cycle and the memory card had been wiped using a five-step system to ensure that the contents would be erased permanently. Despite this, on June 19th, the memory card was able to be restored. 
What detectives found was a nude photo of Jodie with a timestamp of June 4th, proving that Jodie was in fact at Travis's home the day he was murdered. They also found various nude photos of both Travis and Jodie in bed together with the same timestamp. In addition to these, there was also photos of Travis in the shower, some of which looked like he was posing. The last photo taken at 5.30 of Travis seemed clearly posed as he was looking directly into camera. It was obvious that whoever took this photo was someone that Travis was comfortable with. Following this photo, the police believed they caught the murder in action, as it was various blurry shots, including one of Travis on the ground, with blood coming from his head and a leg in the photo. Numerous photos were taken from the camera position on the ground. The police believed that whilst the attacker was attacking Travis, the camera was knocked out of their hand and had fallen to the ground. All suspicion pointed to Jodie. Although there was no direct photos of Jodie killing Travis, the previous photos and the timestamps placed Jodie in Travis Alexander's room at the time making her the only possible killer that they could think of and the evidence suggested. Police believed that whilst he was in the shower, Jodie attacked Travis. He escaped down the hall of his room using the wall to support himself and that's why there was blood smears down the walls. They believed this is where his throat was cut before Jodie dragged him back into the bathroom, shot him and then stuffed his body into the shower. Police believed that Jodie did not intend to leave the camera at the scene of the crime, just forgot it as she was destroying evidence. They also discovered that the gun used to kill Travis was of the same calibre as the gun stolen from Jodie's grandparents' home. On July 15th, Jodie was arrested at her grandparents' home. At the property, they also found Jodie had rented another rental car that was packed with clothes, two knives, a 9mm semi-automatic handgun and condoms. During her interrogation, the police asked Jodie if she had anything to do with Travis's murder, something she adamantly denied. After a period of time, detectives produced the photos taken from the restored camera. They asked her if it was her, and she looked at the photo and said, it looks like me. Jodie tried to use this trip to Utah as her alibi. Her new boyfriend, Ryan, provided the information that she arrived a day later than planned. Her personality was jovial, and Ryan said nothing seemed out of the ordinary about her except her new brown hair and the cuts on her hand, as I previously stated. Detectives tell Jodie they found her DNA at the home. They found strands of hair and also found that contained within the bloody handprint on the wall was a mixture of both Jodie's and Travis's blood. Jodie argued that she had lived there for a period of time and that was why her DNA was in the room. Detectives again point out the time-stamped photos and DNA pointing Jodie to being the killer. Jodie's interrogation is incredibly weird. To this point, it has now become rather famous. She got frustrated with herself that she did not put on any makeup before going and she also decided that she would practice her handstands while she was in the room alone. She also began to sing at one point, singing Holy Night. Her excuse for her odd behaviour was that she was innocent and bored after sitting there for hours. Jodie was booked and put into prison. Jodie was not done with her lies yet, though, as she decided to spin a different tale the next time she spoke to detectives. She confessed to being at Travis's home that night, but when she and Travis were alone in his room, two mass people broke in and went after Travis, trying to assassinate him. They knocked Jodie out before going through her possessions. She claimed she woke up to them attacking Travis and him screaming at her to go get help. One of these, as she called them ninjas, whom she claimed was a woman, attacked her but she managed to get away. When asked if this was true, why did she not call the police? She said her phone was dead and that she was afraid to do so anyway, because the attackers knew her name and where she and her loved ones lived, and she didn't want to put them in any danger. Detectives did not buy this story one bit. The media became obsessed with the story at this point, releasing various news articles and requesting interviews with Jodie to hear her side of the story. When Jodie appeared in court, her appearance had changed greatly. Her hair was brown and she wore ill-fitting clothes and glasses. She claimed that when she went to prison, her eyesight was very poor and she needed her glasses and couldn't help the way she now looked. She looked like she was trying to portray an innocent victim who wouldn't hurt a fly. During trial, a story was put together on what the prosecution thought happened the night of Travis's murder, based on the evidence that they found. When Jodie went to take her trip to Utah, she filled up with two gas cans for her trip to California, then to Utah. They believed this was proof of premeditation, as there were plenty of gas stations along the way to Utah. They then said she turned her phone off so it wouldn't be tracked and made her way to Travis's home. She convinced Travis to let her in. They took sexual photos. At one point, Jodie got Travis into the shower, where she took more photos before beginning her attack. Jodie asked for the final shot to be of him staring right into the camera which is where that final shot came from, before she stabbed him in the chest. They believed he stepped out of the shower, falling forwards towards the sink. Based on the blood splatter, they believed Travis was coughing, as there was a splatter over the sink to suggest this. It's believed that Jodie then came from behind him and stabbed him in the back at this point multiple times. Despite this, Travis was still alive and fighting for his life and tried to break free from Jodie's attack and headed down the hallway. 
it's believed that towards the end of the hallway back into his bedroom he collapsed and fell to the ground. This is where it was believed Jodie slit his throat before dragging him back to the bathroom. She then shot him in the head. Jodie placed Travis's body back into the shower before rinsing him off. Jodie then began to clean up. At this point, she put the bedding in and the camera into the washer before leaving the scene and heading back on the road towards Utah. Once far enough away from Travis Alexander's home, she turned her phone back on once she got back to the main highway. She then called Travis multiple times as well as texting and emailing him to make it seem like she was just checking in and making plans to catch up in the future. During her trial, Jodie went on to take the stand again and once again, her story changed. This time though, it was even more gruesome than before. She confessed to the murder of Travis Alexander, but on the grounds of self-defense. She claimed that he was aggressive and controlling. She tried to display that Travis was not the good Mormon boy that people thought him to be. Jodie then went on to claim the most disgusting part of all of this. She went on to claim that Travis was a paedophile. She said that she walked into the room to find him pleasuring himself with photos of a little boy. This was not true. Jodie then said that while she was taking the photos in the shower, Travis got mad at her and resulting in the camera dropping and her killing Travis in self-defense. She said that she stabbed him when he attacked her and whilst he was down, she retrieved his gun that he had kept in his closet before shooting Travis in the head. She said she blacked out at this point and didn't remember shooting Travis and she did not become conscious of her actions until she was already driving towards Utah. Despite her claims, Jodie was found guilty of murder. The crowds outside erupted in celebration upon hearing this verdict. During her sentencing hearing, Jodie arrived with a custom-made t-shirt with the word survivor on it, still trying to imply that she was a survivor of domestic abuse. If anything, Travis was the victim of domestic abuse in this situation, long before Jodie had even killed him. After a mistrial and a deadlock, Jodie was eventually sentenced to first-degree murder on May 8, 2013, and was sentenced by a judge to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She tried to appeal her sentencing, but she was denied, and she will stay in prison for the rest of her life. This is the story of Jodie Arias and the murder of Travis Alexander. My heart goes out to his siblings and those who love Travis the most. I hope they are doing okay and they are thriving in life despite this huge loss. I'm sure Travis would be so proud of them. Thanks for watching this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you next time. Bye for now.